All right. So, okay, you have to accept. Okay. So, uh, it is a great pleasure to have a second lecture from Jerome. The, the kill, the kill. How do you pronounce exactly your Dakin? Well, the, the French way would be Dakin, and I guess the more English international way is, I don't know, Dakin. Dakin. Okay. Originally Dakin. is Dakin, but I guess it's Dakin. a very, okay. very French uh, pronunciation. So. From University of Namur, <laughs> Belgium. Not Montreal, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, because we have Victor Lee from Montreal, I got confused with all this. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So uh, we are very happy to have the second lecture. People really appreciate uh, very much the first one. It was exactly the right pace. So please, Jerome, the floor is yours. I turn the Stefanina. Can, can I go ahead? Yes. Ah, great. OK. So uh, well, good day, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Uh, so I will be starting by answering first uh, Jean-Francois' question. So um, we got this question by uh, Jean-Francois asking if, uh, at least for the model we have discussed, the, the logistic map, um, the question was, uh, do we have, do we have a periodic orbit of any periods, right? And I say, uh, I replied, I think so. And I also mentioned that I was aware that the period three, um, period, sorry, I was, uh, I admitted someone. So period three orbit was leading to chaos and um, that was correct. So do we have periodic orbits of any logistic map? The answer is yes. Yes, we have. And I found the answer in a, in a, let's say, kind of physical textbook, which is pretty nice, uh, which is the textbook of uh, Julian uh, C. Sprott. And the textbook, textbook, sorry, is, is Chaos and Time Series Analysis. So you can have a look and uh, and what? So what do I want to say? Uh, so he mentioned two papers where this has been demonstrated. Uh, I get the very first paper proved that result in '62, but it was uh, in uh, in Russian and it was uh, later translated in '74. And we got the paper as well of uh, which is quite famous by Lee and York, 1975, saying, saying sorry that period three implies chaos. So the short message is period three. If you have a period three, you have chaos. The converse is wrong. So chaos does not imply period three. Uh, and by the way, period three implies as well uh, periodic orbit, and that that answers your first question. Periodic orbit of every order. And again, if you follow the the, the textbook of uh, oops, ah, how do I do this? Hmm. Whatever, if you follow the book of of oh, it was if you follow the book of uh, Sprott, you will find more details on that. And uh, Jean Francois, just for your information, I have the textbook in my office in Namur, and you are you are welcome to uh, well to borrow it. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So uh, next time, if I try to summarize, we have discussed. Uh, let's say the basics of the logistic model, which is a one dimensional system. And we have seen, not really demonstrated, but I mean, I have tried to explain that you have an infinite cascade of period doubling bifurcation. 
And somehow this leads to a quite complicated dynamics that we call chaos. So we have defined the notion of chaos uh, in the sense of uh, in the sense of uh, De Vanier with three with three conditions. I won't write it again here. And uh, the claim, I don't know if I wrote it, but the proposition was the following. For mu is equal to four, L4. So I don't know if last time I wrote L4 or F4, whatever. And sometimes I write it as Q4 as well for Q4 quadratic because the logistic mapping is a quadratic map. So sometimes I use L, sometimes I use capital F, sometimes I use Q. So this is the same. This is L nu equal Q nu equal Q nu. So the proposition says that for mu is equal to four, uh, L4 is chaotic on, uh, on the wall unit interval. So I will not prove that because it would be a bit too long. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if you are interested in this, uh, you can follow the book uh, of of uh, John Banks, the uh, Banks and several also, and the book is Chaos, a mathematical, it's very nice, very, doesn't require a lot of knowledge, so it's more like for, uh, I mean, undergraduate audience. Chaos, a mathematical introduction, and, and, they prove this claim uh, using the, the, the what we call the unimodal apparatus. So the logistic map is a unimodal map and, and this kind of construction applies for a larger class of one dimensional mapping. So you can follow um, the material there. Uh, so I won't prove it. Nevertheless, I would like to show you at least and to discuss a bit that the first condition we mentioned last time, uh, the sensitivity to the initial condition, I would like you to feel why it is true for the logistic map for mu is equal to four. So uh, let us try to, let's say, to, to have some intuition. Uh, intuition how of why uh, L4 is sensitive to an initial condition. Uh, yeah, so let's do that. Uh, so how we do that, it's really nice. So that's, that's why I would like to uh, discuss it a bit. So let me recall that the logistic map is given by uh, um, by this quadratic expression, right? Uh, and and I claim that uh, I claim, and I let you check that this is true as a side exercise activity. I claim that you can write down explicitly the orbit of the system using some basic uh, trigonometric relationships. So I claim that this, the solution might be written as x at time n is equal to sinus square two to the power two theta zero, where theta zero is such that sine square of theta zero is equal to the initial condition X naught, right? Uh, so I let you check that what I wrote here is, is true. And by the way, and this is a kind of uh, important remark, you see that we will 
So the proposition told us that Q4, I mean, L4 is chaotic, but still we can write down explicitly the, the orbit. I mean, in, in a rather very simple and let's say closed form ex expression. So you do, I mean, the remark I, I'm doing now is that, I mean, even if we have in mind that chaos is very complicated, it is not inconsistent with the fact that solution might be written explicitly and are very simple, as we can see here. So this solution is a chaotic solution, but still it's, it has a, a quite simple ex expression. Uh, so we have this solution and why, why it is useful. Um, it's useful because we will do the following observation. Um, if I define uh, uh, this dynamics, which is pretty simple, I take a point, I multiply it by two, and this is some phasing things. Uh, if you define this, you will have, you can solve, let's say, iterate the dynamics, and you will see that y at, at, time, at time n, sorry, is equal to 2 to the power n theta naught over pi. It's very easy to do. And if you take h, if you define h, the function which takes Z, Z to H of Z is equal to sine square of I Z. You, you, you see that H I when I answer it, Y answer it is equal to, to X N. So why, why it has, it's useful? Because somehow it links, it bridges the uh, dynamics of of the logistic map. So it, it links, let's say, L4 with the doubling mapping, which is this dynamical system here. So it's a, it's a doubling map. Why? Because you multiply by two with, with the doubling map. And this mapping is very simple. In fact, it's, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot this is the double. So we are looking at the doubling map over the unit square. So you need to take uh, mod one, modulo one. We recall that the logistic map is going from zero one to, to zero one. So that's a very simple dynamics where the dynamics is linear by, uh, by part. So you have the unit square here and the graph of the doubling map is nothing else than to two linear uh, branches, right? Now, uh, how are we going to build the intuition that, that uh, Q4 is sensitive to the initial condition? Well, what we do is for a, a number, what we do is that we will write any number in the unit interval using the uh, binary expansion. So for y uh, in O1, uh, we, let's say, we, we, uh, we consider the binary expansion of y. So why does it mean? What does it mean? It means that you write y as, so y is in zero run, so the first digit is zero. You write it as a uh, as an expansion like this, where each of the y i 
uh, is either zero or right. And what, what's the meaning of this? Uh, means that y is equal to zero plus the sum for i is equal to one plus infinity of the s, sorry. E Okay, so the binary expansion. Uh, so we have to be slightly careful because this representation is not unique. For example, if you consider uh, 0 0.5, one half, you can write one half as 0 0.1, or you can write it as uh, 0 0.0111111 with, a, with an infinite Q, right? So what we do is that we identify these this, this, uh, <clears throat> this two representation to deal with a unique, uh, unique writing. Now let's try to understand what does the doubling map when you write the number using the binary representation, it's very convenient. Why? Because the doubling map is nothing else than the so-called shift map. So uh, imagine you have y is equal to 0.1, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 where each of the y, y is in 0 or 1. So the doubling map, so 2 times y, you can check mod one, sorry. What is gonna be, it's gonna be the same, but one index is shifted to the uh, to the left. Y two, Y three, Y four. So in other words, the doubling map is uh, equivalent to the, uh, to the shift operator. Okay. And now it's very convenient from there to, I mean, from there you can feel why, why the dynamics is very sensitive to the uh, initial condition. So take two initially closed initial condition, I zero, that you write all point I one, I two, I three, Oh, blah, blah, blah. And you take y not tilde, which, which is very close to, uh, to y0, y not, sorry. So they are very close. So what does it mean very close? It means that at least they have, uh, well, the, 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 the beginning of the, uh, their binary expansion is the same. So this is y two, two, three, y four, blah, blah, blah. And because they are closed, you know that uh, y is equal to t y uh, for e, uh, in, I don't know, one, two, uh, two, let's say, k minus one. And then you have uh, yk, which is different from yk, right? So now, uh, now on this, let's say, sequence space, So we, we somehow shifted the, the, the view. So from a, a, a number now, we, we to each number, we have a, let's say a sequence. And on this sequence space, we have a, a distance. Defined by, uh, I, so the distance between two sequences will be the sum 
uh, of let's say the component of the sequence but to make it convergent uh, you need to uh, <clears throat> to divide by the, the the size of the beam right so this is a dis distance and if you i mean if we have some uh, if you ne have never seen that i let you i let you check that in fact this is a distance so we have this distance and now uh, as you can see with this choice of closed initial condition we have that d y not the distance between y not and y not tilde is is smaller uh, the first index will be the same so well let me write it completely it's the sum of y And this is equal because the first digits are the same uh, of the sum starting from uh, K. Up to infinity of. Uh, and this is uh, smaller than one over two uh, this is a q of a geometric series q plus one if i'm not wrong or two two to the power q I mean, we have to check but it's you know it's a gauss gauss series so it's very easy to to compute so in fact the distance if you for for a large case this distance is small and now what do i do i just start to iterate the dynamics and if I do it cat times, you get that the distance at time k now. Uh, so how big is this? Well, you see that each time that you apply the dynamics, you will shift one digit to the left. So at, the, at some stage, you will have the expression which will be y at time k will be i don't know for example o point let's say that the first one is one the first time they are different one is one the second one is zero i mean it's symmetric so so one this one will be one will be o point one and then uh y k plus one, y k plus two, blah, blah, blah. And you, you will have that tilde y k will be 0, 0.0 and then, and then we don't know. But for sure, now, if you compute the distance of these two sequence, the distance will be, I use the color code larger than one over two now. So what is the morality? Morality is that you started with very close initial condition here. And just after K iterations, you have a microscopic. There is a, there is a question, there is a question by Roberto. Ah, okay, sorry guys, I don't see questions. So don't hesitate to interrupt me, yeah. There is a question? Roberto? Yeah, Roberto? Yeah, uh, sorry, I was, uh, my mic was silent. Uh, yeah, yes, I was saying that maybe the result of the sum is one over two raised to the power of k minus one instead of k plus one. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe there is a typo, but you see it's, it's very, I mean, it's not very important. Here, it's k minus mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Yeah, so whatever. And the claim is that if you iterate, so from this, uh, yeah, maybe I just need to be more careful and write it properly, but you, you get the, let's say, the, the idea. Oh, I cannot. 
Oh, doesn't work. Why? Sorry, guys, my pen doesn't work. Uh, well, I will try to save and to reboot the. Do you still see my screen, by the way? Hello? Yes. You you see my screen? Yes, yes, we see. You, you yes. Say... Well, I will need to reboot because it's frozen for some reason on my side. So I will just reboot the yeah, I cannot save that or whatever. Yeah, I can save it. Sorry. Technology. Do I have my, yeah, now I have my pen. Do you still see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Perfect. So, so yeah, I was typo was K minus one, but whatever the, the, the idea is that if you, if we iterate, I don't know, we have to count maybe K minus one time, or it might be K times or K plus one. This we can check. But for sure, what you will get is that after a sufficient time, the distance between the two sequences will be now greater than one half. So microscopic difference. So that's why somehow you need an infinite precision. So this explains why Q4 is sensitive to the initial condition. And the key point is, again, I, I, I repeat, is to link the dynamics of Q4 written here with the doubling map, which is given here. And then you, we, you see that the, the doubling the doubling map is nothing else than the shift operator. And then from the shift operator, it's very easy to understand why orbits will separate with time. So that's the, um, the intuition behind. Um, so last time, Stefanella mentioned uh, this kind of, uh, of plot where we see the time evolution of two uh, orbits with closed initial condition. And I will show you such a picture now as an illustration. So I deal with L4, I select X naught is equal to 0 0.1. I select a very close initial condition given by, by X naught plus epsilon and epsilon is equal to, to one, to 10, 10, sorry, to the negative eight. And I iterate the dynamics of L4 60 times. So, and here what we have, so I will show you as usual boss, the orbit and the uh, top web plot. Give me a sec. Yeah. Now you should be able to see it. So. So we start with two orbits with closed initial condition. One is given in dark blue, one is a uh, light blue or green blue. And at the beginning, you don't see any difference between the two orbits, but after some time, they start, they start to, to separate, right? They diverge. And in fact, the difference between two points might be of the order 
of the wall interval, for example, here, you see that uh, at time close to 40, the dynamics is very close to zero. But if you check at the blue one, it's very close to one. So it's a, it's a massive, it's a macroscopic difference. And here you see the uh, cobwebs associated to those two orbits. It's a bit, it's a bit, uh, bit kind of spaghetti plot, uh, but you get the, the 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 message is that you 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 truly see the two orbits. So they are they are now uh, different. All right. Uh, so now I will turn my uh, attention to to this aspect of uh, the sensitivity to initial condition because in most application uh, in most application the sensitivity to initial condition uh, is considered as a signature of chaos. as the signature of chaos. So now we'll turn, we will, we will walk a bit on this, uh, this aspect. And when I say in most application, uh, well, for example, in, in astrophysics or you know, in, in celestial mechanics as well, Right, so if you have heard about, the, let's say, the chaoticity of the solar system by Lascar, usually you check the sensitivity to the initial condition, right? You will not see if the uh, dynamics is topologically transitive and if you have this dense periodic orbit. Usually you just check how sensitive uh, the dynamics is to the initial condition. All right, so let's move to the second part now. So any question? No. Good. So uh, new page. So to this point, We turn now our attention. So two is now sensitive dependence to initial condition. And uh, we will talk, I don't know if I will have time today, but we will slowly introduce Yaponov exponents. All right. Uh, so if we want to do things properly, uh, the, the separation of of orbits with closed initial condition with initially closed initial condition. So this will require the introduction of the so-called tangent space. Uh, but due to time constraint, I will, I, I mean, I will give you again the intuition behind the tangent space, but not the very formal mathematical definition, but still I, I mentioned it. So uh, let me present the, the, the intuition. So let us start.
let us start uh, again with uh, consider the mapping, let's say uh, Xn plus one given by Psi of I Xn. And here I do not necessarily, uh, I do not necessarily assume uh, a one dimensional map. So let's say that Xn is in some domain included in two, R to the power, so it's a bit of silly notation, R to the power K for some K. And uh, imagine, uh, so what, what do we do? Uh, so we have this mapping and we we consider two initially closed condition, initial condition. So two initial condition and epsilon is a small number. Now the natural things to do is to estimate how the uh, how these two initial condition will be how large will be how how large they will be separated after let's say one iteration. So you have x zero, you have x zero plus epsilon. Or Sorry, not necessarily epsilon. You have x zero tilde. It's, it's very small, and what you do is that you apply psi of x zero. You apply psi on this point. That's x tilde one. This is x one. And the question is, what is the size of psi x zero tilde minus psi of x not? And uh, because I assume this mapping to be sufficiently regular, as usual, I linearize the dynamics, and this is nothing else than um, the uh, derivative of psi at point x, x not um, acting on the difference between x not tilde and x not right plus plus uh big tau of of this vector so let's say plus uh tau of x zero minus x zero tilde square right so we just linearize and as usual what do we do we we linearize so we kill we kill we neglect right so uh, to the first order the separation between the two uh, points is given by by this quantity by epsi x not times By this. Now I call I call this vector V0. And we will call this guy the initial uh, tangent vector. And if we talk as physicists, we will say the displacement vector, vector. Uh, sorry, uh, deviation vector. So V0, V0 is the initial deviation vector, the same. So now uh, you, what we what we have just done is that we have defined a very natural operator acting on the uh, initial deviation vector, uh, and the operator we have is to v zero. We have we have applied uh, epsi x not over v zero. And this this uh, this is called the tangent map. So this is so 
So the tangent map is a map which takes an initial tangent vector, apply the uh, differential of psi at a given point over the initial tangent vector. So now what I do is that I repeat, I repeat this procedure. along the world trajectory. And in the jargon, we say that we linearize, we linearize, uh, so this is called the linearization, sorry. Well, oh, it's the same, we linearize um along the trajectory and by doing this we arrive naturally we arrive quite naturally at the so-called tangent dynamics or variational dynamics by iterating the action of the tangent map we just introduced. So we arrive naturally at the variational dynamics. By iterate, iterating, iterating the tangent map. So what is the variational dynamics? So this is uh, the following dynamical system. So we have, we consider the initial, let's, let's say state equation, so to speak, state dynamics. And we uh, introduce the, dynamics of the tangent vector which will be which is given by the action of the tangent map along the trajectory so this is the variational dynamics so we can uh, we can sketch it sketch it sorry if you like to think in terms of of, of uh, diagrams so uh, we start with uh, with a point uh, x zero in a specific domain, and to this point we have been able to to uh, to attach an initial displaced displac deviation vector. Sorry, and. This space is nothing else than the tangent space that I have not really properly defined, but we not we denoted T. So tangent space at point x zero of the domain D. And uh, from this we go again in D by the action of the mapping psi. So this is psi of x0, which is nothing else than x1. And on top, what we do is that we have a dynamics acting on the tangent spaces, and this is given by d psi. And this is v1 is equal to d psi x0 v0. And actually, you could, you can check that this is a tangent space associated to to the image of of x not by psi of t. So now we have these dynamics. Uh, we have both the state dynamics and the tangent vector dynamics as well. So we started with one equation, now we have two. Um, by the way, the procedure is very similar to flow, to flow, sorry. So for continuous model, 
uh, next page, next page, next page. So, the procedure is similar for rows. So imagine you have you, you deal with a, a continuous model x dot is equal to capital X of X. So capital X is your vector field uh, that you assume to be quite regular. And again, X is a point in D in some R to the power N. Um, so the tangent, the variational system is very similar to, to the discrete keys. The variational system consists Cons consist in the following two n OD system x dot is equal to capital X of x and v dot will be uh, the Jacobian of x evaluated along the trajectory as we did for the discrete case here. So we need to evaluate along the trajectory x. So I don't not denote it, but it, the solution depends on t, right? Acting on v. And this is now 2n. So you can think of that of a matrix depending on time t. And the time dependence comes from the from come from the fact that you evaluate the Jacobian along the trajectory, which itself depends on time t. This is given as an exercise. So try to prove it. Now we have some results regarding the um, let's say. Um, how much orbits can be at most separated. So let me mention this proposition. Do, do you have any questions so far? What's the time? Very crystal clear. <laughs> well, okay. So the proposition is the following. Uh, imagine, so let be, so I write this proposition in the continuous case. And by the way, we started with discrete cases. Now I'm talking about continuous cases. So you always have to do the exercise, the mental exercise to go from one wall to the other. So let B, um, oh, sorry, let lambda be a lip sheets constant for your vector field. Uh, capital X, what does it mean? It means that, you know, the difference, sorry, uh, it means that, yes, that you have this uh, inequality where X1 and X2 are two points in the domain D where the dynamics is defined, all right? Um, so we consider this, then the, the, the proposition tells us that the orbits cannot be separated more than an exponential quantity. Then we have the distance, so the flow at time t acting on x1 minus the flow acting over time t on x2. So the distance between uh, these two points will be is smaller than exponential lambda t. Lambda is a Lipschitz, con Lipschitz constant times the initial distance. So I am. I mean, I can give you the ingredients of the proof, but I won't prove it in. Uh, all details. I mean, if you want to discuss about it, maybe you can email me 
later on but the proof it's 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 kind of kind of kind of nice and it's a it's a it's a consequence it is a consequence of any idea in the audience before i write it how would you prove how, how would you prove this kind of of estimate No. Maybe with the kind of series, we'll recover the exponential as being the series. No, just we use the ground wall lemma. Uh, because let, let me remind you, the remainder is this. What does it say? If phi dot is smaller than, let's say, psi phi, then phi t is smaller than phi zero exponential integral t t zero t psi s t s for t smaller larger than t zero so that that was that is what uh, Grunwald lemma tells us and in particular uh, if p dot is smaller than lambda phi then phi t is smaller than phi zero exponential lambda t. So you see uh, phi zero will be this guy and this will be the role played by this quantity here and you have naturally the lambda t term appearing. So the proof is almost uh, given now. Uh, you'd apply this uh, this this uh, this thing so you apply it to the function uh, uh, to a function of 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 uh, time apply it to uh, d the distance to to d which is a function which assigned to time t so distance between the two point All right, so I let you the proof as an exercise. But again, we can we can uh, discuss it. Now, uh, okay, we know that orbits cannot separate more than this exponential quantity, but this is only an upper bound. And in fact, this quantity might be very pessimistic in practice. So the upper bound as usual the upper bound might be very pessimistic my son was crying and now that he sees me teaching he's uh, smiling so come Jacques. Jacques will say hi he's six months old so that's that, this is Jacques first uh, first lecture by the way okay Hello. 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 That's the, that's the first lecture of Jacques on, on the chaos. You I like it? Yes. <laughs> you see, now he's very calm. Huh? He was crying and now he's, uh, he's appeased. <laughs> All right. I hope you get traumatized. <laughs> wow. Uh, so the, this upper bound might be very pessimistic, um, and in fact, in fact, instead of looking instead of looking at the time evolution of the distance. We prefer to look at the growth of the, uh, the of the norm of the tangent vector. Instead of looking at the time evolution of the distance, we look at the growth 
of uh, the norm of the tangent vector v t. And this, I can show you uh, an example to uh, where you will clearly understand what I'm trying to say here. Uh, illustration. Example. Uh, so consider the so-called Arnold's map. Uh, which is a linear map acting on the uh, unit un, uh, unit square, sorry. So the map is given by, by this. Gamma will uh, go from the unit square to the unit square. And this is the image of the vector x, y by the matrix one, one. 0, 1, x, y. And again, because I want to stay in the unit square, I put modulo 1. Uh, so you are, lo you, you are looking at the dynamics in a unit square. Now, uh, whatever, uh, so it's a discrete model, right? Um, Look, it's it's easy to see that the distance between any two points at time, whatever you like, is smaller than what? Do you have a natural threshold? I mean, you are always in the unit square, whatever you do. So the distance between two points is smaller than square root of two, right? Uh, now, I will derive the variational dynamics associated to, uh, to this map. And it's very easy because the dynamics itself is linear. So because the dynamics itself is linear, the variational dynamics is also linear. So the variational equation is the following. Variational equation, uh, we have, uh, v, the tangent vector at times n plus one will be given by d psi, oh, sorry, d gamma. Times v n, and this is a linear transformation. So what you get is, is a, and a does not depend on the dynamics. So that's a v n. All right. So, uh, so it's from there, it's very easy to see that V at times N is equal to uh, A V N minus one, which is equal to A A V N minus two, blah, blah, blah. That's nothing else than A N V zero, right? Now take, take uh, the initial tangent vector V0, align with the eigenvector of the unstable direction. So I claim, so what you do, you do the eigen analysis of this matrix and you will have one stable and one stable, one contracting and one expanding direction. You take the eigen vector associated to the eigen value larger than one. So align with the eigen vector of the unstable direction. Uh, what do we have? Uh, unstable direction, which is associated to the um, eigenvalue. You can check that this is an eigenvalue and it's greater than one. So what do you get if you select V0 like this? You get that Vn is equal to lambda n 
V0. And in particular, the norm of the tangent vectors is equal to lambda n times V0, and it goes to plus infinity when n goes to infinity. And yet, the distance was triv trivially bounded by square root of two. So I hope this this example, uh, I mean, will 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 serve as as an illustration as why we prefer to look, I mean, to why we prefer to quantify the rate of separation of closed orbits by looking at the growth of the norm of the tangent tangent vector and not the distance itself. Uh, how much time I still have, uh, Stefanella? I I guess just five minutes. Oh, okay. ten minutes. Uh, no, just five minutes. Yeah, because we start at one ten. So okay. Uh, have an exercise. <laughs> so, sorry. It's good to have an exercise. <laughs> exactly. So what I will do is that I will give you an exercise. And I will stop there because the program of next time, I mean, I have now all the material to introduce next time the pool of exponents. So as an exercise, uh, I would like you, uh, and I, I encourage you to do it, exercise, uh, I would like you to provide an analytical estimate for, uh, for the growth of the norm of Bn for the logistic map, as we have discussed, for the logistic map with mu is equal to four. So you can do that. And by the way, because I will be in dimension one, the norm is nothing else than the absolute value. So provide an analytical estimate for the growth of Bn for the logistic map with mu is equal to four. So what you have to do is to derive the variational equation and to use the uh, orbits. And I gave you already the, the, um, the solution and you need to see how this combine. And once you have an estimate for this growth, uh of course you you will compare or validate your findings compare or validate let's say with brute force with brute force numerical computation So what do I mean by brute force numerical computation? You, you derive the variational equation and you iterate the dynamics of the tangent map numerically and you compute the growth of the norm of the tangent vector. So you should be able to have a nice consistency between the two approaches. And I will stop there. Uh, next time, uh, next time we will talk about Yapunov exponents and some of their properties and why, why, and we will discuss why they are useful in practice. All right, so thank you. I take any question you have. Okay. Well, it was a great lecture, like the other one, very, very clear. Uh, I, I'm going to call you to give an entire dynamic system course. <laughs> well, uh -huh. that, 
that would be very nice. So well, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, let's say, I notice that maybe I have been too ambitious with my program because I am very slow, but well, it is what it is. Yeah, but it's very clear. I, I'm sure, like, uh, so let, let's think, let's think, uh, open the microphone and let's think, uh, uh, yeah, Jerome. So I like. Uh, Thank you. So, um, question: Do, you, do uh, are you going to send these notes? And did you ask permission for the other notes? And yeah, well, I haven't. Uh, Theo is traveling, so I haven't seen him. But I, I'm sure I can email him. What I can do at the very least is that I can send you the PDF of my of those notes because I yeah. I exported them. So okay, so this that. Yeah, any question from the audience? Let's see. I think I think it was so clear that there are no questions. So I have some curiosities. People in the audience have already uh, worked with the pool of exponents or not? No, to... it's, it's a very heterogeneous uh, audience, you know. Yeah. So for, some of the uh, students have seen uh, something in OD courses they're yeah. undergraduate and they've seen linearization and they've seen uh, uh, um, Artman Grossman theory just you know the hypothesis and so on yeah. but they haven't been exposed at an undergraduate level to Lyapunov exponents you know sure well so I guess they will have the opportunity to learn it then which is yeah good. yeah no, it's very clear there uh, I work on this, so my my thesis was on this, <laughs> right. but uh, very numerical. But um, so I guess some other people have uh, are working on that. I think Roberto is. Are you working on uh, uh Well, uh, not working. I'm I'm familiar with the concept that uh, I'm more on the numerical side and uh, doing. Basically, my work there at Halifa University is, uh, Elena says, okay, we need software to be able to calculate uh, this, whatever. And, and I'm in charge of finding a, a way of doing that uh, fast enough. Sure. Oh, okay. Well, in, in practice, we, I mean, what do I mean in practice? Let's say in celestial mechanics or in the astro community, usually we, I mean, the equation of motions we have are, are, are so heavy that we rely on numerical estimation, of course, of those quantities. Uh, so, I mean, you cannot, for, I mean, you know, the, the, the last exercise I left to you guys, you can do this kind of estimate because, uh, well, because the dynamics is one dimensional, we have explicitly the orbits, et cetera, right? So it's a kind of toy model, but in practice, you cannot evaluate it's, let's say by ends, so to speak, the, the growth of this tangent vector. So you need to, to estimate it numerically. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Uh, as I told you, I mean, I, I know what the Japonov exponents are, how to compute them, but well, just for uh, professional reasons, I never had the, the chance of uh, actually working with them hands on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mostly I spend my days uh, knowing, okay, how do we compute uh, the field expansion of the gravity field up to whatever we need for a given position, yeah. which uh, may be pretty high. And then we have to add, uh, well, uh, earth tides, ocean tides, and uh, some uh, albedo radiation pressure, many things. So uh, it's uh, it gets actually heavy on the... Um, computational load. So my work is to find a way of uh, making this thing feasible. Sure. And, and by the way, uh, the dynamics you are, you are dealing with is not average, or is it? No, it's uh, exact so it's, if you want to, to sure. call it that way. I mean, uh, we are not neglecting any any terms or uh, yeah, so it's, it's, taking it's the average really of anything. Yeah. So we are just uh, doing, uh, well, uh, using your language from before, uh, brute force uh, propagation. Yeah, yeah osculating dynamics. Uh, 
actually it's not even osculating. We usually work uh, directly in uh, uh, partition uh, coordinates and. Oh, okay, sure. I mean, uh, sometimes I, I I use the osculating elements and integrate that, but for most of the things uh, that I that I do, I mean, uh, there's no. Uh, simple to use uh, pseudo analytical model that you can fall back to. So I just go Cartesian and and that that's just that that's the job. Sure. Actually, the, those orbits are so so perturbed that uh, if you look at the osculating elements in one orbit, I mean it, it's a total mess. So it doesn't solve uh, much of the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a there's a a significant difference between the the average elements in one orbit and the osculating instantaneous values. Sure. So actually, when when we want to to extract some uh, some orbital uh, elements from from those things, usually we average uh, afterwards in in process over one orbit. Because otherwise, you see something that is changing all the time. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Well, good. But uh, yeah, I'm a bit out of the water here because uh, I'm uh, I'm from the structural analysis uh, side by formation. So mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, my job is solving. Uh, well, now now it's easier than before. Usually it was solving uh, partial differential equations. Now it's simply. <laughs> Ordinary differential equations, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, more into the numerical details and less on the theoretical side. Sure. Well, I will present next week, I guess, if I have time, uh, some pseudo code to compute the Lyapunov exponents, and okay. I will also highlight that Lyapunov exponents are not, so to speak, the best quantities to compute because, as you, as we will see, uh, Lyapunov exponents are time average quantities. And it takes time for them to saturate, so to speak. Uh, we have faster indicators than the Lyapunov exponents, but I mean, as usual, when we talk about chaos, we talk about Lyapunov exponents because they have been, let's say, the first. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a standard. Actually, there's yeah. one thing I have on the back burner for for when I have some time, but uh, we we I want to try applying. Uh, what do we call that? Uh, uh, La Lagrangian, uh, yeah. yeah, Lagrangian descriptors to these things we are uh, we are working on now. That yeah. uh, at, at least from my point of view, that I come from the pure mechanics uh, community, it's uh, closer to the kind of things that uh, we usually do. Uh -huh. Great. Okay. Well, good. Okay. So well, uh, uh, thanks again for for the lectures. Very Thank interesting you. for for me that I'm um, an alien to this. Oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> kind of treatment. Roberto, if you send me a, an email, there is the video are on the on the school web page, so you can see again, you know, watch, and I can send some material, so you you will be. Oh, that, that, uh, that, that that would be great. Thank you. So I, I will I will send an email to you. Yes. Yes. No problem. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you very much, and looking forward for uh, next Tuesday and the third lecture. Sure. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, Jerome. Was great. See you okay. guys. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, bye.